Ash was hospitalized again. Alicia, Virginia, and his sister Martha committed him to Trenton State Hospital, the former New Jersey lunatic asylum. At this point, we didn't know whether this was going to be a very long, very expensive process. And we had been advised that Trenton was a good hospital. McLean Hospital had been kind of a, a country club. Trenton was a crowded, open ward. When he arrived at Trenton State, he was assigned a number and was mocked and told to sweep up, and it was a terrible thing. When his colleagues heard where Nash was, many were outraged. Who's going to figure out what is wrong with a the genius there, asked one. It is in the national interest, warned another, that everything possible be done to protect Nash's exceptional mind. Trenton State was known for its aggressive treatments, including insulin coma therapy, which by 1961 had been phased out in all but a few hospitals. Insulin coma was developed under the mistaken notion that schizophrenia was caused by a metabolic problem, by the way the body regulates glucose. Insulin coma was one of the more popular and unfortunately one of the more notorious treatments in its day. I don't remember all the details. It's the sort of thing that, uh, like if you go under anesthesia, you don't, you remember only the process up to the anesthesia. A nurse would wake patients early in the morning and give them an injection of insulin. Their blood sugar would drop and soon they would be comatose. Some patients would suffer spontaneous seizures. Insulin coma deliberately puts the body into total shock. This was done under supervised circumstances because if you do that too aggressively, you can die. I remember some of the surrounding events. There would be a group of people that would be getting it, and then afterwards, they would go out on the ground and pass some time and drink sugar water. I got the thinking of the cruelty to animals. I became a vegetarian at the time that I was in the uh, uh, Trenton Hospital. I was sort of thought that one could protest against this sort of treatment. Nash endured insulin treatments five days a week for six weeks. His symptoms diminished, and after six months of confinement, he was finally discharged. No one knew what the long-term effects of his treatment might be. He came to visit us, and it was after this awful treatment, and he looked like he had been battered and... and through some devastating something and, and spoke of it a little bit himself. And it was, you know, it was kind of heartbreaking. He said these treatments that he had gone through had wiped out his early memory. So I think what he was doing, he was visiting me and different people to see if he could get his memory back. In 1961, Nash was 33 and unemployed. Former Princeton colleagues secured him a research position, and he managed to publish a paper on fluid dynamics, his first piece of work in four years. He seemed to be better, but inside Nash felt a sense of loss. Rational thought, he wrote, imposes a limit on a person's relation to the cosmos. He later called his remission periods interludes of enforced rationality. 
to some extent, sanity is a form of conformity. People are always selling the idea that people who have mental illness are suffering. But it's really not so simple. Uh, I think uh, mental illness or madness can be an escape also. The following summer, he left for Europe alone, once again obsessed with asylum. Before long, friends and family began receiving letters and postcards. It wasn't the type of letter you would expect to receive from a father. How are you doing or what have you been up to? It was unbelievable how these things were supposed to mean something. They were frightening in a way, the letters. And they made use of all the things that had been in his life. Mathematics was a kind of numerology and politics mixed with paranoia. Distraught after three years of turmoil, Alicia filed for divorce in December 1962. Her complaint charged that Nash resented her for committing him and had deserted her without support. In 1961, Nash was 33 and unemployed. Former Princeton colleagues secured him a research position, and he managed to publish a paper on fluid dynamics, his first piece of work in four years. He seemed to be better, but inside Nash felt a sense of loss. Rational thought, he wrote, imposes a limit on a person's relation to the cosmos. He later called his remission periods interludes of enforced rationality. To some extent, sanity is a form of conformity. People are always selling the idea that people who have mental illness are suffering. But it's really not so simple. Uh, I think uh, mental illness or madness can be an escape also. The following summer, he left for Europe alone, once again obsessed with asylum. Before long, friends and family began receiving letters and postcards. It wasn't the type of letter you would expect to receive from a father how you doing or what have you been up to. It was unbelievable how these things were supposed to mean something. They were frightening in a way, the letters. And they made use of all the things that had been in his life. Mathematics was a kind of numerology and politics mixed with paranoia. Distraught after three years of turmoil, Alicia filed for divorce in December 1962. Her complaint charged that Nash resented her for committing him and had deserted her without support. Mathematicians from MIT and Princeton found Nash an academic position in Boston. They got him an apartment and arranged for him to meet weekly with a psychiatrist who prescribed antipsychotic medication. Gradually, he seemed to improve. He was pretty sane, recalled a colleague. He was a much nicer person. 
the old ego stuff was gone. He began seeing Eleanor and their son John again. We had gotten into a pattern of going out every Saturday. I started to grow more fond of him as he was around more. And then he went you know, as quickly as he came. So. Less than a year after moving to Boston, Nash stopped taking his medication and his symptoms resurfaced. These medicines interfere with vitality, with drive, with thinking. So the price that many patients had to pay from being on these medicines was that they felt lifeless, like it takes away their soul. Well, he was afraid of anything that would alter the quality of his mind. And as anyone doesn't want to be forced to do something they don't want to do, or they don't choose to do. And John had always been very independent about what he chose to do. His delusions were now joined by a chorus of voices in his head. The kinds of hallucinations that are most common in schizophrenia are auditory hallucinations of voices of a certain kind. One kind would be two or more voices which are talking about the ongoing behavior of the patient. So if I were schizophrenic, I might hear, you know, John and Mary saying, okay, so, so why is Louis doing that now? And then Mary would say to John, oh, he's just a jerk. He always does that kind of thing. They go back and forth, but it's sort of a commentary, often critical on my ongoing behavior. You're really talking to yourself. It's what the voices are. He said he understood that there was something that went on between people that was alien to him. He was sort of enclosed in a bubble, that he felt lonely. In 1970, Alicia Nash had a change of heart. She felt John's repeated hospitalizations had been a mistake. Alicia decided to let him move back in with her and promised never to commit him again. I didn't think he should just be hospitalized in an institution and left there. And I just felt it was best for him to, to be on the outside. She took him back not as her husband, but as somebody who needed help and nobody else would have him. Giving him shelter and meals and protection made a tremendous difference in his well-being. If she hadn't taken him in, he would have wound up on the streets. I think that Alicia saved his life. Princeton students began noticing a strange sight on campus. Entire blackboards filled with minutely written formulas and secret codes. Rumors spread it was the work of a mysterious figure who wore red sneakers and kept to himself. They called him the Phantom. There were all kinds of myths about him. The students would tell each other that he had gone mad because of a too difficult problem he tried to crack or after a rival beat him to the punch. And students were aware that the powers that be were protecting him. From time to time, you would see in your office you know, under the door, sort of huge number of sheets that's been worked out the night before, uh, computing the probabilities of certain coincidences, very detailed computations. He was into proving the existence of God. I felt that I might get a divine revelation by seeing a certain number, a great coincidence.